All right, so today we're moving into chapter 11, uh, the public speaking preparation part of this course. Hopefully we'll have some time to come back to a couple of the earlier chapters, but I really want to make sure that you folks meet the requirement and get those speeches out of the way while we're still locked down in this crazy COVID world. So chapter 11 talks about public speaking preparation, steps one through six. So the earlier you can get to watch this video and the earlier you can start working on your speech, the better off you're going to be. So the textbook actually talks about 10 different stages with regards to public speech preparation. First, we start all the way down here by selecting our topic, our purposes, and our thesis. So you wanna make sure that you find a topic area as soon as you can, and you get that topic area, you post it up on Canvas so I can give you some kind of feedback about what you're going to do for your informative speech. Second, and this is the new stage that we're gonna talk about here, this notion of audience analysis. How do I make my topic real, immediate? How do I get my audience interested in what I'm trying to talk to them about? Then third, you're gonna to start to research that topic. You're gonna to go into those databases. You're gonna to go to EBSCOhost. You're gonna to go to Nexus Uni. You're gonna go into ProQuest. You're gonna try and find as much research as you possibly can to teach the audience something new, or at least something more than they'd find in their average Google search. You're gonna collect those supporting materials. So your quotations, your visual aids, your statistics, your graphs, all this stuff you're gonna to put together Collectively, Aristotle refers to these as the inartistic proofs, and then those supporting materials are going to justify the major claims that you have inside of your speech. Then from those materials, you're gonna develop your main points. You might grab some main points here and add them into your speech. You might take larger topic areas and split them into two main points, but you're gonna kind of make a, make a call of what's fair and balanced for most of the areas that you're gonna talk about during your actual speech. You're gonna try and organize those speech materials. So you're gonna put them in, let's say, a chronological structure where you talk about the past, the present, and then maybe the future. Or maybe you're gonna talk about a spatial structure where you talk about the top, the left side, the right side, and the bottom. Or maybe you're gonna use one of the other numbers of different organizational structures that we have inside of the textbook. Now that kind of takes us up to the end of chapter 11. But then in chapter 12, we'll talk about how to word it effectively, constructing your introduction and your conclusion, rehearsing it, and then finally, of course, delivering your speech over and over again so it comes off in the best way possible when presenting it to your audience. So what do we do at the beginning? How am I gonna try and find a good area that I wanna talk about with my audience? Well, it takes a lot of brainstorming. You know, you gotta take some time to think about it. And it's important too, because if you find a really good topic area, the rest of your speech is gonna almost write itself. It's gonna be interesting and involving, and everybody's gonna love it. However, if you pick sort of a poor area, then the audience is gonna be bored, you're gonna be trying to find deeper and darker research so you can get their attention, and it just makes your life a lot harder. So you wanna find a worthwhile topic that it's a pretty good interest to the audience. And odds are, since we're in a college class, if it tends to interest you, odds are it'll probably interest a lot of other people inside of the class itself. Now, when you're thinking about these topics, you know, keep yourself in mind. If you don't have a good topic that motivates you, that's interesting to you, that keeps you up late at night doing the extra research through the databases, then odds are you're not going to do that extra research. You're not gonna get a good score on it. So you wanna find something that interests you because odds are, at least in an afternoon class where most people are around the same age, same beliefs, same educational level, you know, odds are you folks probably sort of think alike. Maybe a little bit different with a night class where we have different ages, different occupations, but still, if something's of universal and importance to you, odds are probably other people will find it interesting as well. Now, I recommend trying brainstorming. If you haven't brainstormed, where you just sit down and write out as many thoughts as you possibly can, I would say try to guide your brainstorming research by first thinking about stuff that you know a lot about. So information that you already know, that would be easy for you to research. Maybe stuff that you already have a couple of books laying around that talk about. This will make your job pretty much an easier process when writing your speech. Or something you'd like to know more about, something that you want to research, something that excites you in some kind of way. So then you're gonna end up spending that extra time over the next couple of weeks really delving into the research, trying to learn more because it's something you've always found curious. 
Now, in addition to that, after you have a bunch of your ideas out there, you might want to start making lists out of them, seeing which ones can be put together, which ones might be broken apart. We'll talk about this in the next slide. You also may want to sort of take a look at surveys that are out there in the real world to see what's interesting to other people that are out there, you know? I mean, not necessarily see what's trending on Twitter or something like that, but odds are, you know, there are good surveys that sort of show what's on the, the finger on the pulse, what's on everybody's tip of the tongue, you know, the cool ideas that everybody wants to take a look at in today's day and age. And then, of course, finally, uh, check news sites. You know, I, I, in this world of fake news and false media and all this stuff, you know, uh, ever since the coronavirus, a lot of these good newspapers have been giving out free subscriptions. So every morning when I wake up and doom scroll like the rest of you folks, uh, I get the New York Times, you know, Big Five that comes in, I get the Newsweek Big Five, and of course I get Apple News as well. So, you know, usually I kind of get a good idea of what's kind of coming on, you know, and they tend to be sort of reputable journalistic sources as opposed to pundits that are just sort of going off about whatever makes them angry <laughs> over the course of the day. But checking news sites, of course, can give you new interesting piece, pieces of information that you can take a look at. Now, when using these topic lists, right, so when you think about listing out these different areas, remember that every topic can be both good and bad. So you can have a topic that's too broad, and then after six minutes, the audience really hasn't learned anything new. Or you could have a topic that's too small, and you can't find enough research for you to get it out to that five to seven minute window, shooting for six, that we're gonna try and do for this informative speech. So you wanna to plan to cover a limited topic, but you wanna go in depth. So you wanna have something that's manageable, but you wanna go deep enough that we're learning something new out of it. And rather than just looking at a broad topic superficially, right? So if you were one of the classic example of a topic area that everybody's seeming to pick in this COVID era is anxiety, so you could do a broad speech about anxiety, how it increases your heart rate, how it creates all different types of depression, you know, but that's pretty broad. What you wanna do is you wanna focus in. You wanna take anxiety specifically in a COVID era, and you can talk about the certain triggers that people are having, or anxiety may be created by domestic abuse. That way you have something that's smaller, more manageable, and really when you delve into it and take deeper research, you can teach us something new. Now what you want to do is repeatedly divide out the topic. So if you have a broad topic, that's okay. You can divide it out. And here's a pretty good example of this. So let's say, you know, maybe you want to be a communication major like me. Best major in the world. <laughs> Uh, so mass communication is a big part of our field, right? We spend a lot of time looking at newspapers, TV, movies, and how they spread their information across the rest of the world. But that would be way too large to talk about in a six-minute speech. So maybe I want to take ma uh, mass communication, look at internet, film, television, radio, advertising, maybe just focus it on television. Well, what's inside of television? Well, I could look at reality shows, comedy shows, news shows, soap operas, sports shows, or maybe even quiz shows. Well, let's say I want to pick soap operas. Well, what happens in soap operas? Well, you got women in, men in, or maybe relationships of. It's so funny, I love these new soap operas where guys have to make out with mannequins now <laughs> because of COVID. But let's say I'm looking at mass communication, television, soap operas, specifically relationships of those soap operas, and then we can look at the different types, friendship, business, romantic, or family. Let's say we want to look at business relationships between people of the same sex. So now I've really focused it down. I want to do a topic area where I'm talking about mass communication on TV through soap operas and the relationships of those soap operas, specifically in the world of business between same-sex individuals. That gives me a nice, good, focused way of taking a look at a particular topic area. And odds are, in that six minutes, I'm probably going to teach you folks or come up with something that you haven't heard before. Now, when you're selecting your purposes, so remember that in public speaking, there are always purposes for what you're trying to do. Remember back in chapter one, remember that all communication has an effect. I'm trying to get something out there for you folks. Now, what kind of effect am I desiring? Well, pretty much for the purposes of this class, there's only going to be two, either to inform someone or to persuade someone. So there are two general purposes. And know this for the final exam. There are two general purposes for public speaking. 
to inform what you folks are going to be doing in this first speech, teaching us something new, or to persuade, where I'm going to try and move you along a continuum towards a different value structure or agreeing or disagreeing with a controversial topic area. Now, after you have your general purpose, and for all of you, it's going to be to inform, you want to now put it down into your specific purpose, which identifies the information that you want to communicate to the audience and the, or the attitude or behavior you want to change inside of a persuasive speech. So the specific purpose is to inform my class about, let's say, the steps of public speaking. Or later on, when we have a persuasive speech, to persuade the class that COVID mask wearing is the best thing that we can do, <laughs> or something along those lines. So remember, a specific purpose it identifies the information, the, the area that we're gonna talk about, and the audience that we're gonna deliver it to. So now we're taking it from a general into a specific. And then from this, you should be able to develop a thesis statement. So I pretty much gave you folks the thesis statement, and I've given you a pretty good rough draft of one for the informative speech. But you know, technically, really, when you're thinking about your thesis, you should go through the purposes, the specific purposes, and then moving into the one and the many, your one major claim to the audience, and the multiple points that divide it up. That goes all the way back to the days of Plato, actually. <laughs> So your thesis is the main idea that you want to convey to the audience. This is what Plato would refer to as the one, the concept of the form that I'm trying to, to inform you folks about. Now the thesis is a summary of the speech into one simple declarative statement. So try not to write six sentences for your thesis. Try to keep it down to one, kind of like the example that I provided on sort of the informative outline lecture that is also going up on YouTube. So the thesis and the purpose of the speech are similar, and they both guide you into selecting and organizing your ideas. So after you have a specific purpose, I'm going to inform the class about the st major stages of speech preparation, then I can preview up. First, we're gonna talk about selecting a topic and our purposes. Second, we're gonna talk about audience analysis. And third, we're gonna talk about gathering research materials, right? So now I'm giving you a full thesis statement that has a preview of the main points that are going to come. Remember, you're always gonna tell them what you're gonna tell them, you're gonna tell them, and then you're gonna tell them what you told them. <laughs> so that kind of gets us through what your major topic area is. Now you've got your topic area, so now this is what I wanna talk about with regards to the audience. But then how do I get the audience interested? So first I grab their attention, right? I ask a question, I tell a joke, I tell a story, uh, or any of those other particular attention grabbing mechanisms. But then I wanna think about the audience. What is, what is something they have in common that I can play off of? Or what we refer to as the audience's sociology. So when analyzing an audience, be careful not to assume that everybody's the exact same, but you can make some minor assumptions probably based around similar demographic characteristics, you know, sociological factors that we all share. I mean, for example, everybody in this class right now sitting through Zoom lectures, right? And you probably hate it. You can't stand clicking on YouTube anymore. Oh man, it's driving you nuts, right? We're all experiencing Zoom fatigue. <laughs> or you could also play off of the fact that odds are a majority of the people in your class are probably around the same age. So you might have similar things in mind. You might be thinking, hey, how do I get out of my parents' house, right? Or you might think about things that they don't pay attention to. So if you've got a young audience, odds are most of you folks probably don't give much of a damn about what's gonna happen to social security, right? So your age can be a number of different variables or factors or, or things that you can play off of, thinking that the audience probably in most of these classes, classes ranges from 17 to about 23, 24 years old. You can also play off of gender. So if you have a topic that is particularly advisable for women or particularly advisable for men, you can make an extra statement saying, hey, all the men in here should listen to this because of blank, blank, or blank, or all the women in here should pay close attention to my speech because it can help you out in blank, blank, or blank. So, or you can play off of both of them, right? So women, you should listen to me because of this, and to any of you guys that are in relationships, this is gonna help you out with your lady friend. <laughs> uh, sorry, homo homosexuals relationships aside. 
Now, uh, in addition to that, we also have cultural factors. So odds are you folks probably have a number of different cultural mores or standards that have been ingrained in you ever since childhood. You know, remember we talked about America being a very individualistic society, right? We can talk about the cultural factors of the American dream. So you could all have those 2.3 cars, 3.2 kids, white picket fence, 6.3 TVs, right? And eventually that houseboat. <laughs> or other cultural factors that we can play off of in a number of different ways. In addition to this, you can also play off of religion, right? So we can play back to sort of uh, Christian morals. Obviously, Trump had a pretty interesting one when he talked about how, I thought COVID was a blessing from God. <laughs> A curious rhetorical analysis there. <laughs> but again, we can play off of religious values inside of our speech as well. One of the biggest areas that almost everybody can play off of is education. So everybody in this class is trying to take this class, probably to get a GE requirement, probably to try and increase your GPA, so you can try to get to that four-year university that gets you that bachelor's degree, that gets you that extra couple of million dollars over the course of your life, which then gets you the white picket fence, the 3.2 kids, et cetera, et cetera. But you can play off of educational values. Odds are the average person in this class is probably a little bit smarter than the average bear that's out there. I mean, I think recently uh, statistics show that one out of five or one out of four people in the United States actually complete a bachelor's degree. So you are kind of a little bit farther skewed away from the average of the, of the population. So you can play off that education. Odds are your audience is pretty smart. Play to it. We also have occupation and income, which for most of you folks, probably still stay at home with mom and dad, probably haven't filed your taxes yet, these kinds of things, but you might have older individuals inside of your class that already have themselves established in an occupation, they have a decent level of income, and they're going back to college because they want to increase that. So you can still play off of that, because pretty much everybody needs more money. Gosh knows I sure do right now. <laughs> uh, there are also relational issues that we can play off of. So it seems that most of my classes didn't have too many people in relationships, but maybe you can play off that singleness as well. So individuals that are single right now might have uh, similar values that you can play off of. You know, uh, In addition to this, we all have values, so individualism in American society, liberty, freedom in American society, uh, that American dream, well, the American dream of course plays into the values as well but the rugged individual being able to pull yourself up from your bootstraps and become whatever you want to become, very big value structure, at least in American society. We all probably have some special interests out there too, right? So odds are in this class, somebody in here probably is really into cars. Somebody in here is probably really into serial killers. <laughs> or at least it always seems that way in Cyprus. <laughs> Uh, but we all have some special interests, you know, some of you folks might be STEM people that are really into science and math. But, you know, sort of as you get to know other people, and even going back over some of the box speeches that you folks saw, you can probably see some things. I, I kind of noticed that throughout my classes, uh, there were a significant number of students that talked about traveling. You know, I, I, maybe that's the new thing. I, I kind of noticed that actually over the last couple of years, that uh, it used to be I wanted to get married, settle down, have kids. Now it's like, forget the kids. I just want to go around the world. <laughs> so who knows, right? Maybe everybody just wants to get a Winnebago and cruise America nowadays. Uh, we also have political belief structures that you can play off of. Of course, we're super polarized now in today's day and age, but you can still play around those political beliefs. Because I honestly think that no matter how Republican or how Democrat, no matter how red or how blue you are right now, I think everybody out there really kind of wishes for more bipartisanship. I know one of the big things that I'm attacking people on social media is, is hey man, I don't hate you because you're ex. I'm not gonna unfriend you because of politics. I personally like you. You know, like I, I've been trying to do that a little bit more now, and I've been getting some pretty good results. Because the truth is, it's just politics. <laughs> I mean, for crying out loud, we're talking more about a fly that landed on uh, Pence's head than anything that was substantive in the last debate. Uh, finally, of course, we have organizational memberships. So everybody has these memberships, especially in your discipline, as you get, you know, Society of Engineers, um, or even, you know, if you're unionized, if you don't have a degree, or if you're going into a technical field, these kinds of things. So we, we all have different memberships that are out there that you can play off of as well. You know, you can even talk about, I guess, you know, being college students is almost an organization that you're all part of right now. These are all areas that you can play off of when you're talking about your audience analysis step. 
So that's kind of the audience's sociology. So those are all the different variables that play into that we can kind of see similarities across. But we also want to think about what psychologically some of these individuals might be going through. So you might want to sort of think about what is my average audience member thinking? So remember back in the listening chapter, at any given point in time, only one out of five students is listening to you. Like right now, only one out of five YouTube videos, you're actually listening to what I have to say, right? And even during lecture, one out of five people are actually focusing in and paying attention. And remember, only 12% of the class can actually repeat back what you've just taught them. So how do you entice them in? How do you really get them to pay more attention to what you're trying to say? Well, ask yourself these questions. First of all, how willing is your audience? You know, it's a lot better inside of a real classroom. And gosh, I almost want to cry that I'm lecturing in front of an empty one right now. But uh, inside of a Zoom world, it's, it's harder to grab their attention. It's hard to get them to put their cameras on. It's hard for them to give you eye contact. It's hard to get them to sit up from the bed. <laughs> but uh, how willing is your audience to listen to you? So you've got an extra hurdle now. And it's unfortunate in this day and age, but, but if you do have a really interesting topic, you might be able to get them in. And in every class, there still are those few students that are really paying attention, that no matter what, they're always gonna be your friendly people that are out there. That's why you, know, you wanna make that eye contact, get them to raise their hands in their Zoom screen, because those are the friendly faces that you can go back to when you're trying to get that little extra oomph that gets you through your speech. Second, you wanna ask how knowledgeable your audience is. You know, time and time again, I always tell students, you know, odds are, the students are a lot smarter than you think they are. And the truth is, is that they are. I mean, at this stage, if you folks have gotten to college and you're doing research, you know, odds are you know how to do a basic Google search. At least by the end of this class, you folks will be able to do a Google Scholar search, a database search. You'll be able to find good information that's out there that's nonpartisan, that's peer reviewed, these kinds of things. So you should always say, hey, you know what, I'm gonna start with my audience at about this level, you know, and challenge them at that level and try and raise them up a little bit because that will keep them interesting. If they're, if they're listening and they're learning something new, you know, it's, it's hard to pull away as soon as you get that involvement. And then finally, and this is probably more in your persuasive topic area, but how favorable is your audience? How much do they already agree with you on a particular topic area? So, you know, in an informative speech where you're teaching everybody how to save a couple of extra bucks here and there, odds are they're probably going to be pretty favorable to you, right? Or if you're giving an informative speech about a horrible disease that might kill people off, eh, they're probably going to pay a little bit more attention to you because of the topic area. So this is where topic selection really helps you out. You're trying to figure out how favorable is the audience already to listen to me. And it's usually based around what they need, i.e. money, to be safe, you know, these kinds of things, or what they're interested in, you know, something intellectually engaging, maybe related to their major, or maybe something that helps them through this crazy educational process that we call online learning. Now, during your speech, and this is, this is one of the sad things that I really wish we were back in the classroom for, because as you span out across the audience, you realize you've got to change what you're saying, you gotta double check yourself, you gotta check to see if that person's actually listening to you. You still kinda get it in a Zoom world, you can still see some of the people that are nodding off, playing video games, playing around with their phone or whatever, but uh, during your actual speech, if you see that you're losing the audience, sometimes you actually adapt during your speech, and, and this is a hard skill to acquire, and hopefully we get a little bit of it in this class, and in the future when you folks are giving speeches in front of live audiences, remember this is very key. Your ability to take that little extra lean to the side, or do that extra little ad lib here and there, to make sure you pull the audience back on your page, is something that's going to significantly help out the effectiveness of your particular level of discourse. So remember, when you folks are in front of an unknown audience, right, so you're in front of all these other college students, um, you want to focus on the listeners as them sending messages back to you. So you're going to see that stuff, right? You're going to see people nodding, you're going to see people giving you thumbs up. Okay? You might even see people talking stuff inside of the chat. You know, pay attention to these other nonverbal feedback loops, because this is going to affect the way in which you're going to deliver the speech to them. Remember also, 
those what if questions, right? The what if, well, what if they need to know this? What if they have this problem? These things uh, are answering those questions. You know, what if they already are rich and they don't need extra money? Well, I'll still tell you how to make a couple extra bucks because we can still use it no matter how much we got, right? And asking those extra what if questions can really help you have more in your, your arsenal, if you will, to adapt to while giving your actual speech. And then finally, address audience responses directly. So if somebody, yeah, I mean, this is a lot easier to do in person where you just call them out, right? But I don't know, I mean, you folks have probably seen me do it a few times during lecture. Hey, if somebody's falling asleep on you, I give you full permission to say, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> if you want to during your speech. They might hate you, but hey, go for it, right? <laughs> so uh, let's take a second to talk about research. Now, one of the things that I think still pulls through that's very important in this class is this notion that you folks do get to use databases, you're required to use the databases, you're required to find books, because I really think it's a lost art. It's so funny, back when I was in grad school, there was this amazing book we had to read. So this is all the way back in 1985, by the way. Uh, Neil Postman's Amusing Ourselves to Death, right? Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. And all the way back in 1985, he predicts that these reality stars, that these television personalities are going to become the big leaders. I mean, of course, Reagan is in power in the 80s, so we already saw a little bit of it. But man, boy, did this guy predict Trump. <laughs> oh, boy. Good Lord. And Schwarzenegger, right, being the governor of California. But he has an amazing quote, and I love this quote to this day, that people will come to adore the technologies that undo their own capacities to think. And this is Neil Postman. He was a professor of culture and communication uh, at NYU, one of the biggest names in the field back then. And it's true. I really think that, you know, it's so funny when, when we saw the internet sort of, you know, so I mean, I was getting out of high school as AOL was starting to become the first internet World Wide Web thing. Uh, so I still had to physically walk into libraries, you know, grab books, smell the books, you know, use the microfiche and these kinds of things, but now it's so much easier. I mean, you folks can go straight into a database, put in your search terms, you instantaneously get thousands of results. You can go into a Google and do a search and get thousands of results. But uh, these technologies really do hurt our abilities to do that old school classic research, I think, that, that now instead of going to reputable news outlets, we just look at Facebook or whatever social media posts are being put up. And this undoes our capacity to critically think and evaluate other information that's out there. I encourage you folks that to, when you're doing research for this speech, to go deep, to take the extra step, to really delve into something past page one. Instead of doing a Google search, you do a Google Scholar search, right? Instead of just you know, putting in Wikipedia pages, right? You put in stuff that you find from the databases. Or at least you go to the bottom of the Wikipedia page where they have the sources, where they got the information from. Taking that what we call second and third line levels of research really does not only increase your abilities to critically analyze issues, but also your overall sort of renaissance knowledge. Your ability to research is something that is universal to all majors. And I think this is one of the most powerful things that you can pull from this class, and one of the things that I'll be critiquing you on very, very specifically, because I want you to think. <laughs> so how do we research? Well, research, of course, the systematic investigation of information. It is an investigation of relevant information for your particular topic. When I was in grad school, I had a, a really great professor, and he said, Kasim, when you're doing research, you want to set up your critical lens, your, your focus, if you will, and you want to find that plane, everything that is within your critical focus, and then do a focal plane analysis, that you're capturing everything that's within that particular window. And that's what you're trying to do here. Now, granted, I'm not going to ask you folks to do things like find the original source for your particular topic area, or go into the archives of a library back to the 1700s, but, uh, but, you know, I think his advice is good, that you know what binds or what bounds your particular level of research, and then you try and find every article you can that hits upon that particular focus. And then from that focus, you know, you begin your search examining what you already know about that particular area. So you know a lot about, I don't know, let's say coronavirus, right? And let's say we go back to these examples that I gave you. So let's say you want to know about antiviral drugs. 
You start with remdesivir, and then you find out about Tamiflu. As you continue your search, you're going to get more search terms, and then you're going to determine whether or not those search terms are inside of your original focal plane, whether or not you want to expand it or contract it. So you continue your search. You continue to use more and more Boolean terms that you find through your, your general overview, and you continue to find more and more detailed sources. And then after you're done with those sources, you go back and you say, hey, are these all just scholarly articles? Are they all just Wikipedia? Are they all just newspaper articles? Well, then you start to open it up by getting a variety of different sources so you can justify your claim for multiple different modalities, for multiple different disciplines. And then that's going to give you a nice, well-rounded level of research to put in to your actual speech. Primarily, though, for this class, odds are you'll probably have three different areas, right? So you're going to find some news sources, so that would be ProQuest, Nexus Uni. You're going to find some biographical material. You're probably going to find this in EBSCOhost or the eBooks. And then you're going to find academic research articles, probably also through EBSCOhost. It's a pretty powerful search engine. But making sure that you use multiple search engines is going to give you a variety of the different types of sources to investigate. So let's say you know, we are talking about antiviral medications for COVID-19. You're going to have news sources about Trump recently taking them after he came out of Walter Reed Medical Center. You're also going to have his biography or what he's saying about what these are like, or even other people that have gone through COVID in their own personal stories. And then you're going to go back and find things like the Journal of the American Medical Association, the double-blind studies where they gave people monoclonal antibodies and didn't give other people monoclonal antibodies to see if there was an effect size between the two groups. And then when you have all of these together, then you really get to hit on the true Aristotelian ethos, pathos, and logos. You've got a variety of sources from different experts in the field enhancing your ethos. You've got the personal stories from biographical material, which gives you good emotions or pathos, right? And then you've got academic research articles, which give you clear logical causal chains that show that in a double-blind study where I gave someone a placebo here and I gave someone the treatment here, we see that the treatment group had, on average, 10 days less time of recovery or something along those lines, enhancing your logos. Now... I know that when you folks think about the research in this class, it, it, it's always tough for students because they're like, wow, you want me to say the name of the author, the qualifications of the author, the title of the article, and the date? Well, of course, this is probably a little bit more than what you do in a traditional speech in front of other audiences. But the reason why we do this is to enhance your critical thinking skills. And those critical thinking skills should be something you take away from this class. That every time you see something on Facebook or you, on Instagram or some link that somebody sent over to you, you should be asking yourself these questions as to whether or not you want to quote unquote believe what that information actually is. So remember, all research materials, they must be evaluated. You evaluate them as you're reading them. Other students in the class will evaluate them as you're saying them to them, and vice versa, right? When people are critiquing each other's speeches, you're gonna say, hey, why are you talking about a recent COVID treatment with research that comes from 2019? Right? Man, we've already had so much time, right? So overall, though, when you're thinking about research, there are five essential criteria. Right, so first of all, the qualifications. So that's what I'm trying to ingrain in you folks. This person's a professor, this person's a lawyer, this person's a doctor, this person's gone to school in some kind of way to enhance their qualifications, or they've been through life itself. They've spent a lot of time, years of experience on the job, enhancing their quali qualifications in that kind of way. Second, you want to ask yourself, how current is the material? Now, of course, this changes from topic to topic, right? If you're talking about philosophy, then yeah, you could probably put in something from the 1400s, 1300s, you know, if you want to go all the way back. However, if you're talking about something like a recent COVID vaccine, then you probably want something that's more current, or where the stock market's going to go in the next couple of weeks. You probably want something that's more current. Even a couple of days can be completely different with regards to the currency. So everybody in this class always telling us the date. If you can't find the date, then you're at least telling us when the web page was last updated or when the website was last accessed. You always want to make sure that you allow people to see the currency of your particular information. You also want to make sure that it's fair. 
You know, there are a lot of websites, there are a lot of organizations that are right wing or left wing, and you want to be able to identify this. You know, knowing that the Heritage Foundation is a right wing think tank, you know, something to know before you start incorporating that information into your research, like Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, uh, the Institute for, for, for Progress in Society on the left, you know. Uh, you want to make sure that your information is fair, that it holds to journalistic ethics. Remember, journalists are different than pundits. Journalists have to give us verifiability. They have to tell us it's verified by two sources. I've checked this research. I have a source, right? These kinds of things. It's independent, that they are saying something completely independent from any political leading, right? And that it has to be, it has to have some sort of accountability, that if they are found wrong, then they have to apologize. Remember, the New York Times still has to print a correction if they've messed something up, you know, because they try to have, <laughs> or they try to have some kind of level of journalistic integrity. Now, we don't have this when we have pundits, right? So when you have, you know, Tucker Carlson going off about some kind of left-wing whatever, or, or how right-wing this is, or something like that, he doesn't have to apologize if he's wrong. As a matter of fact, it was kind of funny. I was just reading an, a recent article where uh, one of the old Playboy uh, girls who was suing Trump was attacked by Tar Tucker Carlson, and they went all the way up the courts on a libel case. And in the end, the libel case actually said that since Tucker Carlson is a pundit who no one would take seriously, he's not news, he has no accountability, that she could not sue him for libel because a reasonable person would actually not accept that information as being a realistic uh, portrayal of news. Uh, finally, or the next two areas, sufficiency and accuracy, are also important. You want to make sure that the research is sufficient. You want to make sure that they've done enough studies to figure out this information. So the classic example here, of course, was hydroxychloroquine. So the original study came out of upstate New York, and the guy had 100 patients, and he found some results, right? That if you take hydroxychloroquine with uh, azithromycin and you give it to people, there's a higher chance that they would recover in a shorter amount of time. Now, of course, that sample size was not large enough, right? So then they took that anecdotal evidence, and then they tried testing it on the veterans' uh, affairs area, right? They tried giving it to a larger subset. I want to say it was something like 1,900 people, and then eventually found that it was not statistically significant. So you want to make sure that the original research that you're looking at here is sufficient. Another classic example, of course, is vaccines, right? The original study on whether or not the MMR vaccine actually gives you autism came from the Lancet research that only had 13 people. So 13 people is not enough to generalize. The same thing that's going on right now with clinical trials, right? We want to rush this vaccine to get it out to people, but you still need to have a large enough sample size. You need to have at least 30,000 people to have a stage three trial, of, uh, to have a sufficient number of people to see if we have any weird adverse side effects within smaller aspects of the population. Finally, you want to make sure that your research is accurate, right? There are different types of media organizations out there that will just tell you bald-faced lies. Man, I can't believe that we're not fact-checking these debates, right? I can't believe that we just don't have like a BS meter on the bottom of everything. Oh, man, there are a bunch of great media fact-check sites. Uh, there are a bunch of great media bias sites that are out there, too. So when you're looking at you know, something from Breitbart News, you might want to go back and do media bias Breitbart News, and then it'll give you a number of these different areas that'll tell you how accurate the reporting is from those particular websites or those particular news organizations. Always do a double check on this. It's the first thing I do when anybody sends me a crazy article. I'm like, what? Hang on. Let's bias check that. Let's fact check it. Yeah. Snopes. I love Snopes, man. <laughs> Justifying the accuracy and reliability of any information out there. Now, you want to make sure that you integrate this back into your speech. And this can be difficult because it seems really long. But remember, you always, at the beginning of every one of your quotations, you want to mention your sources, right? You want to give the author's name. You want to give their qualification. You want to give the titles. You want to give the dates, right? So you want to have as much information out there. Always err on the side of putting more qualifications in there. Because that, in fact, enhances your ethos. The more ethos you have, the more believable, the more credible you are to the audience, and then the more that they're going to pay attention to you as the speech progresses. Inside of your outline, I want this too, right? So in case you forget to say it, at least I can give you partial credit. You also want to make sure that in your written outline, you've got all those source citations, and then at the end, you've got that works cited page. So in case I want to double check it, 
Because odds are, you know, somebody in this class is going to teach me something new, and I'm going to be like, ooh, interesting, let me look that up, right? So if you give me the full MLA or APA site, it's good for me to look it up, and, and heck, I'll get to learn something new. So it's the small little blessing of teaching in a COVID era. So now we're moving on to step four. So step four is now we're taking that research, we're taking the stories, we're taking all that information that you found, and we're trying to figure out a way to, to collapse it into different supporting materials. So way back in the day, in Aristotle's book on rhetoric, uh, and I even got a quote up on the YouTubes as well about it all, but uh, he talks about this notion of what we call inartistic proofs versus artistic proofs. So out there in the real world, there are proofs, right? So We've got documents, contracts that we've signed with other individuals. Uh, he talks about uh, testimony from slaves that are under torture. Uh, we've got you know, the hearsay that other people have said about a particular individual. Uh, all these things all create you know, a, a level of proof, the evidence, if you will, in a legal battle. The, the information, whether it be you know, direct or whether it be circumstantial, still the evidence that you would use to justify it. And then what Aristotle says is that certain types of proofs can be enhanced with certain artistic proofs, ethos, pathos, and logos. So that if you have a good, credible source, you know, that someone with high qualifications, you know, they're a professor, they're a doctor, and they're saying it in a recent age, and it's published in a reputable journal, this is going to enhance your credibility. And then, of course, if you've got a good story about someone who's going through troubling times or, or someone who's I don't know, locked in a cage down at the border or something like that, these can be really emotional or pathos appeals that we have out there. And then finally, of course, sometimes argument structures that are put out, you know, philosophically, or just laid out in a logical pattern, can create their own types of persuasion by looking at how A leads to B, or how B leads to C. We see this a lot in, like, let's say, the climate change debate, right? Increased levels of CO2, increased greenhouse gas emissions, which then eventually creates of a rebirth, some back and forth of different solar waves, which increases the temperature, and then as we move up one or two degrees Celsius, bad things start to happen. So in your informative speech, you're gonna be using things like examples, illustrations, testimony of various authorities. These are all gonna enhance your ethos. Sometimes if you're making a logos claim, you need to define what the term actually is in the beginning. Uh, you may be using numerical data or statistics which gives us sort of a snapshot of where the world is at at any given point in time. And then of course, remember for this first speech, everybody needs to have at least one visual aid. So something that you're gonna hold up to the camera or something that you're gonna try and, well, <laughs> try and splice in, I don't know. Or maybe some object that you have that you can fondle with. Or if you have a tablet, you can pull it up and show it to us. So you're gonna have some kind of presentation aid that's going to accompany your speech to give us more information about your particular topic area. Inside of your persuasive speeches, you're gonna take this a step further by adding logical support or a logos appeal to your particular argument, motivational support or a pathos appeal to your stories to just pull at our heartstrings, make us cry, right? Or make us feel hope or make us feel scared, you know, these different types of motivations that are out there. And then of course, finally, ethos or credibility appeals. Listen to me because I've done my homework. I've spent that extra time researching all the way till four o'clock in the morning because I love Cosm's class and I want to get an A. <laughs> and then of course, finally, you know, I just gotta say it, please don't plagiarize. Sometimes I will Google, you know, because I got a lot of extra time on my hands, uh, some of the words out of your speech. So please do not grab another speech from anybody else or grab something online. Uh, if you're caught plagiarizing, you will be dealt with accordingly. <laughs> Okay, getting close to here, right? So now we're moving to step five. So now you've got the information, you've organized it up into different areas, different visual aids, different quotations, different stories, and then now you wanna develop these into your main points. Because remember, in the end, you wanna kinda of have a balanced speech. You wanna have your first point go about as long as your second point, your second point go about as long as your third, and you want a good, nice, logical flow with transitions in between all of your main points. So once you phrase your thesis statement, the main points or the main divisions of your speech should sort of emerge out. So you've done your research, you've tried to figure it out, you know what areas are the big areas that you want to chat about. So, you know, uh, I don't know, just like in the example, right? So COVID-19 seems to be about, you know, antivirals like remdesivir. 
uh, monoclonal antibodies like the Regeneron, and then of course steroids, right, like dexamethasone. So you could have, you know, sort of three natural areas that you find throughout your research, or, you know, um, gosh, even, you know, if you're doing a process, right, like even if you were to do something as cheesy as how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right, you got your materials, you need your bread, you need your peanut butter, you need your jelly. You got your process, right? You put the bread in the toaster, take out the bread, you put on the jelly, you put on the peanut butter, you put the two together, right? And then stage three, you eat it. Mmm, I could go for a PB&J right now. <laughs> uh, but the speech time it naturally suggests itself into a logical structure. Now, as you're going through, you might find that some points don't make that much sense. They don't work that well, right? Like, let's say you want to do a speech about COVID and you're using old hydroxychloroquine research, right? You might, hey, throw it out, right? You might want to select points that are more relevant, that are more interesting to you, the new age, the cutting research, all the new stuff that's coming out. Maybe that's more interesting to you and you think it'll be more interesting to your audience. So you want to put that information out there. Uh, now, as you get more advanced, if you really want to, you can start using what we call parallelism. So things like alliteration, where you use the same thing over and over, or the same consonant sound over and over again, or assonance, where you use the same vowel sound over and over again, or parallelism, right? You look at the pros and the cons, the good and the bad. Um, these all become natural ways to think about stuff. So uh, when I was back in grad school, uh, I wrote a book on, or I wrote, it was practically a book, <laughs> a big, thick paper on uh, how creative people work. And so we're talking about creative, uh, creative processes in the organization. And uh, I think we, we, got, we broke it down. The first point was the person. How do you be, increase your creativity personally? Uh, then it was the process. How can we create a more creative process that allows people to brainstorm more ideas? Uh, and then we had uh, the creative product, right? What kind of uh, products that go out there into the real world are really seen as being creative ideas, right? So, so the three Ps, right? It's a person, process, product, you know, kind of gives you a nice easier way to, to remember those propositions when it goes out there in front of the audience if you, if you want to. And then finally, uh, as you're developing those main points, remember you want to develop them uniquely. As a matter of fact, I even tell students develop your main points first. You go into your main points, you really want to get those things up there, because when those main points are perfect, then the thesis already writes itself, the review already writes itself, the visual aids seem to fall into place, right? And then at the end, you can kind of think about, okay, how do I grab their attention, or how do I conclude it off? You know, if you, really, if you work on, work on inside out, work on the meat first, right? Then the, the lettuce and the bun and the cheese will all just sort of fall into place. <laughs> uh, gosh, I'm hungry. Peanut butter and jelly, now hamburgers. What am I doing? <laughs> Okay, finally, last slide. Thanks for hanging through this YouTube video. Smash the subscribe button on the bottom. <laughs> okay. uh, so finally, of course, there are numbers of different organizations. So I talked about chronological structures, you know, the past, present, future, and spatial structures, the top, middle, bottom, that kind of stuff. Uh, but there are a number that the textbook talk about. So the first one is the one I've probably been talking about the most, and what most of you folks will probably do, the chronological or time pattern. So you talk about the past, the present, the future. Then, of course, we have the spatial pattern, right? So the top, the middle, the bottom, or the north, the east, the west, and the south, you know, these kinds of things. It's moved around geographical or physical space. There's a topical pattern. So as you're doing your research, you just find natural topic areas that sort of emerge from it. So the example I gave of how we were fighting COVID-19 through remdesivir, which is an antiviral, monoclonal antibodies, which attack the actual S spike proteins, and then finally steroids, right, that use a whole different host of different muscle building and sort of decrease or increasing uh, immune response within the body. There's also, so if you're talking about something that happened in the past, you might use what we call just a problem solution pattern. So like back when I was a young little whippersnapper back in, back in Reagan's day, uh, we had a big problem with the ozone layer. So let's say if you want to do a speech about the ozone layer, you could talk about how we had an ozone layer, and we've done a pretty good job of regenerating it. I remember Australia was just constantly under it, and everybody was worried about all this ozone problem that we had. And you know, we, with proper solutions and, and decreasing pollution, we did seem to put a pretty good stamp on it. Uh, there's also cause effects or effect cause patterns. So if you have something that happened in the past that was a number of preceding factors led to an effect that was out there in some kind of way, 
So maybe if you want to talk about, you know, why so many Americans believe in the deep state, you know, and well, maybe because they become disenfranchised in our society, thinking that career politicians aren't taking care of them. And then this has led to a general animosity or an angst, which then makes them more vulnerable to things like, you know, QAnon and other conspiracy theories that say we're all run by a bunch of Satanists, you know, sacrificing babies at the bottom of pizza parlors. Uh, but we do see cause-effect patterns happen all over the place, too, right? So, you know, glaciers receding, um, or just even at, the, at a more simple level, let's see. Uh, let, let's say we take the Zika virus, right? You know, uh, and, 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 and decicephalopathy, right? All these kids that were born with little tiny heads. You can talk about how we had this problem in Brazil, where all these kids were born with small heads. How did we go back and find that the cause was one of those little mosquitoes? And man, I swear, there's so many of these ankle biters around here right now. <laughs> this campus. <Woo. laughs> um, you could also talk about a structure function pattern. So there's a structure of something and then what it does. So like, let's say you want to do a classic speech on how an engine works or something, right? There's a structure, right? We have cylinders. Those cylinders have pistons that go up and down from them. And then we let gas and air in, in different areas. And then there's a stroke where we have compression, combustion, expulsion, you know, these kinds of things. And then you talk about the function. As these pistons go up and down, they turn a crankshaft. That crankshaft turns your flywheel. And then your car goes boom. <laughs> You could do a comparison contrast type of pattern. I'm sure most of you folks had to do this back in high school when you had to read two books, you know. Uh, the grapes of wrath is like of mice and men because of, you know, these particular metaphors. Uh, but comparisons and contrasts can happen all over the place too, right? You know, people can compare and contrast, you know, different types of ideologies or political parties or any of these types of things that are out there. There are lots of different ways that we can compare two different events that are out there or contrast two different events that are out there. We can do pros and cons. So for the informative speech, you know, you want to look at both sides of an issue. For the persuasive speech, not so much, right? Because you just want to take either the pro or the con side. But if you're doing it informative, you could talk about both sides of a particular issue. You could have a claim and proof. So you could have a claim that's out there. So there, you know, QAnon is real, let's say, right? And then if you can give sufficient proof to justify that or to claim that up, you know, this can give you your own structural pattern. Here we have a major claim, and here's all the proof that goes behind it. You know, I, gosh, man, I, a couple of years ago, everybody was about flat earth, right? So I almost always had a student who did a speech on flat earth theory, and they always have a couple of examples to try and justify or could tend to prove it up in some kind of way. But we have these claim and proof patterns as well. It's kind of interesting. I mean, what happened? I, I mean, everybody seemed to be a flat earther like four years ago. I guess maybe just it's not cool anymore or something. Who knows, right? Uh, you could have a pattern that's based around multiple different definitions of a term that's out there. So uh, let's say you know you want to take a look at just ways in which we view God, right? So you could be a deist, you could be a theist, you could be an atheist, you could be an agnostic. You know, you could have multiple different je definitions or different subsets of a larger pattern that's out there. Um, if you folks like the journalistic, this is one of the rare instances that you might actually go up to five points. You could do a who, what, why, where, and when kind of pattern about a particular historical event. And then finally, of course, you could do a fiction fact pattern. Uh, one of the best speeches I saw, actually, actually in this room, right, here in Cyprus about two years ago, uh, was a student who wanted to show up uh, really the Jurassic Park stuff, being able to, you know, take a dinosaur bone and create dinosaurs from it, was something that you could really do, right? So a fictional world where these big dinosaurs are attacking us, and then she went into the actual facts. You know, can we actually extract the DNA? Is the DNA enough that we can recombinate it in some kind of way? Can we actually just state something in vitro outside of the womb of another dinosaur and create, in fact, another dinosaur. Very, very awesome speech. Uh, but just uh, there's a fiction, and then let's look at the facts behind it. It be another type of pattern that you folks use for your speech. So this takes us through the first major six steps of your speech. So this week, if you get the chance to watch this video, we'll be going it over it in class as well. But try to get to this stuff as early as you can because the more time you have to choose your topic area, to think about your audience, to begin your research, to start folding out your different types of supporting materials, your visual aids, your quotations, your stories, then taking those and developing those into the main points, then you're gonna have a nice strong outline, or at least the main points of an outline, that you can show to me in class, and I can start evaluating. And then, of course, you wanna make sure that those points are organized, and we can talk about this too, organizing those points in a particular persuasive pattern. 
So with that, that takes us through chapter 11. I hope this helps, and I hope that you folks smash and subscribe the extra button below.